Dear brothers and sisters, friends, and guests, we welcome you to the groundbreaking ceremony for the Modesto, California Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are grateful for the participation of those joining us here on site and also through technology. We are pleased to recognize Gary B. Sabin, General Authority 70, and member of the North America West Area Presidency who presides over this ceremony. Elder Sabin is accompanied by his wife, wife Valerie. I am Robert Spellman and I am joined by my wife Linda. We have had the privilege of serving uh, as groundbreaking coordinators for this event and Elder Sabin has asked that I conduct these services. We extend our special recognition to Mayor Sue Zawalan of Modesto, which many of you know. In addition, we recognize other church leaders, interfaith, government, civic, and education leaders. We truly appreciate your attendance and join with us today for this wonderful and exciting event. We extend our appreciation to those who have served on the groundbreaking committee as volunteers or in other capacities in the planning and preparation of this event today. We will begin today's service with an invocation offered by Sister Cheryl Fulgerberg, a member of the Merced Stake. Our beloved Heavenly Father, we are honored to be gathered here today at this momentous occasion in the ground making of a new house of the Lord in Modesto, California. We as thy saints are so grateful for this sacred temple to be built in our midst. We are thankful we have many members who will have the opportunity to serve our ancestors, grow closer to our Savior, feel his spirit, and receive his inspiration inside these holy walls. We bless all those that live in this temple district to have the desire to come often to serve in the temple. To fill the rooms of the temple, completing the saving ordinances and covenants for those who have passed to the other side of the veil, as we help to gather Israel in preparation for our Lord's second coming. We pray that all those in this community will be blessed by this holy temple, that members and non-members alike will feel the spirit of the Lord when they are near that those people will have curiosity about the temple and have a desire to learn about the temple and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that all the planning, designing, and construction of the temple will go forth as planned with no delays and will be completed on time and within budget. Bless all those who participate in the construction of this temple to be protected. We thank all the community leaders who have granted permission for the building of this temple, and we especially thank our prophet for being inspired to build a temple here. We pray that ministry angels will surround this holy sacred grounds and protect all those who will come to this holy temple, that they might go forth with power from on high. These things we pray for and thank thee in the name of our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sister Fulberg. Since the beginning of this dispensation, groundbreaking ceremonies for temples have been a part of the history of the church. The first temple location revealed to Joseph Smith was Independence, Missouri. In those revelations, the Lord identified the spot for the temple and commanded that the land be consecrated and dedicated. To fulfill the Lord's command, the church has moved to a symbolic great groundbreaking ceremony to commence construction of the house of the Lord. As we celebrate the commencement of the construction of this house of the Lord, let us remember the reason that we build these sacred temples. It is so that we can make sacred covenants with our Heavenly Father and receive priesthood ordinances that will bind us to Him and to our Savior Jesus Christ. We will now move forward with the groundbreaking program as follows. Our first speaker will be Corbin Curran a young man from the Lodi Stake. He will be followed by Addison Castleton, a young woman from the Merced Stake. 
Next we will then hear from Jerry Callister, also the Merced Stake, and then we'll have the pleasure of lis uh, listening to Sis uh, Sue Zewellen, the Modesto City Mayor and a member of the Modesto California North Stake. After Mayor Zewellen, we will hear from a primary choir from the Modesto Stake, who will sing a medley including High on a Mountain Top and I Love to See the Temple. They are led by chorister Diana Hansen and accompanied by pianist Shinobu Kennedy. Brother Curran. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, my name is Corbin Curran. I'm a 17-year-old senior at Calaveras High School and I'm preparing to serve a mission so I'm very grateful for this opportunity because it has taught me so much as I prepare to leave. Today I've been asked to talk about my feelings while serving in the temple. I love going to the temple and entering to the temple for the first time is a very special memory of mine. Walking through the temple doors for the first time and feeling the warmth of the spirit the warmth of the Spirit welcoming me to the house of the Lord can only be described as one word, and that word is joy. But as I prepared for this, for this assignment, the Spirit has directed my thoughts towards what it means to be like Christ. So what does it mean to be like Christ? I've thought about this question, and I talked with my dad about the question, and he directed me to Moroni 7, verse 48, which teaches us, those who are like Christ shall see him as he is. Covenants and temple recommends are a perfect example of what it means to be like Christ. As we strive to keep covenants and stay worthy of a temple recommend, we strengthen our relationship with Christ. And we learn to mean we learn what it means to be like Christ and we find joy in that. Elder Runland in this past conference, Elder Runlin taught us that we can access the power of God through temple covenants, but only when we through temp Elder Runlin taught us that we can access the power of God, but only when we connect through to, with temple covenants. As we serve in the temple, we find joy. As we strive to be like Christ, we find joy. And that's what the temple is all about, brothers and sisters, is becoming like Christ and finding joy in doing so. I testify that as we serve in the temple, we become more like Christ, and we shall see him as he is in the final days. I testify that as we see him as he is in the final days, we shall be purified as he is pure. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I have often wondered what our heavenly home is like. There is no place in the world where I feel closer to the Lord than in one of his holy temples. To paraphrase one of my favorite poems, how far is heaven, it's not very far. In temples of God, it's right where we are. The Lord has taught us, quote, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, end quote. To members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the temple is the most sacred place on earth. It is the house of the Lord, and just as the inscription on the exterior of the Modesto Temple will soon read, the temple is holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. In the temple, the precious plan of God is taught. It is in the temple that eternal covenants are made. The temple lifts us, exalts us, stands as a beacon for all to see, and points us towards celestial glory and eternal happiness. It is quite literally the house of God. All that occurs within the walls of the temple point us toward our Savior Jesus Christ and the gift of His atonement. My personal, oh, the temple is for families one of the greatest treasures we have in mortality. I have loved attending the temple with my family. Whether it was attending temple open houses as a little girl or participating in vicarious baptisms during my teenage years, the temple has always been a place where I have felt close to my Savior. 
Dressing in white and setting aside the cares of the world, I have found the temple to be a constant source of peace and comfort. My personal temple service has been full of experience where I feel heaven and earth come together in a unity of purpose and peace. It is a place where I have come to know my Heavenly Father and His eternal plan for me. It is a place where I have come to know that I am a beloved daughter of Heavenly Parents with a divine nature and eternal destiny. President Russell M. Nelson has taught, quote, Each holy temple stands as a symbol of our membership in the church, as a sign of our faith in life after death, and as a sacred step toward eternal glory for us and our families. Building and maintaining temples may not change your life, but spending your time in the temple surely will, end quote. Each time I attend the temple, I feel deeply of the Savior's infinite love for me and for all of God's children. President Nelson further taught, quote, The temple is the house of the Lord, the basis for every temple, ordinance, and covenant. The heart of the plan of salvation is the atonement of Jesus Christ, end quote. The beautiful building that will one day stand in this very site will serve not only as a beacon of light to the community of Modesto, but will be a place for those who are seeking home and heaven and peace in this world will come and enter its walls and find heaven right where we are. How far is heaven, you ask? I testify that in the holy temples it is not far at all, for it is in these sacred places that heaven and earth meet, and our Heavenly Father gives his children his greatest blessings. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When I was asked to speak, they said they were looking for a church pioneer here in the Central Valley. Well, I must confess, I've never driven a covered wagon or pulled a handcart. But I was born 80 years ago here in the valley and have lived most of my life here. The real pioneers, however, were my parents. My father was born in Blackfoot, Idaho. In 1937, he graduated from Utah State Agricultural College and at that time, the government was giving grants to high schools here in the valley that would hire ag teachers. Livingston High School hired my dad to be their ag teacher and to coach in athletics. My mother was born in Beaver, Utah. Her family was quite poor, but she was determined to get a college education. Her uncle was a professor at, Utah, at Fresno State College and he volunteered to let her stay in their home and be a nanny for their children so that she could pursue her education. She graduated in elementary education and then took a teaching position in Madeira. My parents met at a church fireside in Fresno. They later married in the St. George Temple and started housekeeping in Livingston. <clears throat> now I want to pause here for a moment and to find a few terms that we use in the church, but for you who are our guests, you probably would not know what they mean. Very small congregations of the church are called branches, and small clusters of small congregations are organized into districts. When congregations become large and they can have the full program of the church, they are called wards, and clusters of wards are organized into stakes. When I was growing up, there were no wards or stakes anywhere in the Central Valley. We just had small branches and districts. My father became the president of the Merced branch where we attended church. My parents <clears throat> were determined that their children would grow up with strong testimonies of the Savior. That they would serve missions and marry in the temple. But the church was so small here they feared this would not happen. So quietly they decided that they would eventually move back to Utah where the church was strong. It was about this time that Elder Ezra Taft Benson, who was then a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church, toured through the Central Valley. He interviewed my parents and during the course of the interview they told him about their concern for their children and their plans to move back to Utah. Elder Benson took them by the hands, looked them straight in the eyes, and said, Elton and Beth, you are not needed in Utah. The Lord needs you right here. I promise you, 
that if you'll get off your suitcases and bury your roots deep here in the San Joaquin Valley and help the church grow, you will not lose any of your children. What a promise. That's all they needed. They put their suitcases away. They bought a home in Merced and decided to raise their family here. My father later was called to be in the Fresno District Presidency. Every Sunday, from early morning till late at night, he was traveling up and down the roads, helping to form new branches, call people to positions, and building the church here in the Central Valley. Eventually, all those small wards became, or small branches became large wards, and districts turned into stakes, and the full program of the church was offered here. Beautiful chapels were built in almost every community. And the members of the church started serving their community. Many of them served on city councils, as mayors, as county administrators, on the board of supervisors, as members of school districts. Our members serve by being doctors, dentists, lawyers, teachers, firemen, and serving the community in many ways. And our young people consistently are leaders in their schools. Now the crowning evidence of the growth of the church in any area is the dedication of a temple. This temple is going to bless not just Modesto, but all the communities around it. It is in the temple that families can be sealed for time and for all eternity. Now for our guests, what does it mean to be sealed? After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to his remaining apostles and he commissioned them to be the leaders of his church. To the apostle Peter, who was the senior apostle, he said, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Another word for bind is seal. With the proper seating authority, baptisms and marriages can be effective not just in this life, but in the next life as well, in heaven. Now about four weeks ago, a faithful widow came to the Fresno Temple to have her deceased husband sealed to his deceased parents by proxy. Her husband had been a pilot, he had his own private plane, and about 12 years ago, he took off in his plane and disappeared. When the wreckage was found, he of course was dead. Christine was left with a small young family, including a teenage boy by the name of Chase. Chase grew up and married his sweetheart Susan in the temple, and they had two children. About six years ago, Chase and his neighbor friend took off in the neighbor's small airplane. The whole family was there on the runway to see them off. The plane soared into the sky, flew over the bluff, and then disappeared. And they heard a terrible noise. Christine ran as fast as she could towards the bluff and climbed down, which took her some time. When she got to the bottom, her daughter-in-law, Susan, and the wife of the pilot met her, but they were also met by a fireman who told them they could not go any further. And he announced to them that all the occupants of the plane had perished. After a few moments of silence and shock, the wife of the pilot turned to Susan and said, oh, Susan, I am so sorry. Susan responded, thank you, but we will be all right. Chase and I were sealed in the temple, and we are a forever family. In essence, she was saying, I know I will see Chase again, and he will be mine, and I will still be his. That is the power and the blessing of temples. Of that truth, I testify 
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I want to welcome all of you to Modesto, California for this beautiful occasion. I am humbled beyond words to be invited to speak to you today. I was born in Modesto and have lived my life here. I love the Central Valley. This soon to be built temple will be called the Modesto Temple, but it will be enjoyed by our friends from the many cities and communities that I love all around our city. Gary Stevenson, a leader in our church, gave a talk entitled Sacred Homes, Sacred Temples. He said, under the definition of temple in our Bible dictionary, we read the following. It is the most holy of any place of worship on the earth, followed by this insightful statement. Only the home can compare with the temple in sacredness. He went on. Recently, he said in a church conference, all present were invited to take a virtual tour of their homes using their spiritual eyes. I would like to invite each of you, he said, to do this also. Wherever your home may be and whatever its configuration, the application of principles within its walls is universal. Let's begin. Imagine that you are opening your front door and walking inside your home. What do you see and how do you feel? Is it a place of love, peace, and refuge from the world? Is it clean and orderly? As you walk through the rooms of your home, do you see uplifting images? Is your bedroom or sleeping area a place for personal reflection and prayer? Is your gathering area or kitchen a place where food is prepared and enjoyed together, allowing uplifting conversation and family time? Can you find your personal study space? Does the music you hear or the entertainment you see, online or otherwise, uplift you and your family? Is the conversation without contention? He said, perhaps you as I found a few spots that need some home improvement. Hopefully, he said, not an extreme home makeover. <laughs> Whether our living space is large or small, humble or extravagant, there is a place for each of these priorities in each of our homes. We are told to establish a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God, which provides divine insight into the type of home the Lord would have us build. There is a unity between the temple and the home, he said. If our homes that we are responsible for are uplifted, I believe our communities will be uplifted. We will care for each other, our friends, co-workers, and neighbors. Please come to the, often to the temple grounds and feel the peaceful surroundings. The same guiding peaceful principles we feel in our homes and the temple will improve our communities. Our police chief, Brandon Gillespie, is here today. He and all of our officers, as well as our community leaders, strive day and night for peaceful communities. I invite everyone here to make our homes a place of peace and harmony. Then our cities will be safer as well. Many before us were dedicated, loving community servants who adhered to these principles in their homes. And they're the reason we will have this temple. One who comes to mind is Grace Bjarnason, a single mother of six children. She was a longtime friend of mine, a faithful church leader, and an elementary school teacher. Another is Tony Marshall, my son-in-law's father who tragically died. He had to be cheering from above for this temple. He helped plan for it and grew the church, serving as a leader of the entire North Modesto community, an engineer, an architect, seminary teacher, and bishop. 
Another example are my in-laws, Betty, a piano teacher, and Ken Zwollen, a PhD chemist, moved to Modesto in 1957. They spent the past seven decades raising eight children and now have 46 grandchildren and 84 great-grandchildren. They served more family, friends, neighbors, and those in need in our community than could be imagined. They drove every Wednesday and Saturday to serve in the Oakland Temple for 22 years. This was from 1996 to 2018, at which time the temple was closed for remodeling. At that time, Grandpa Zwollen was 91 years old, and Grandma was 88. She's now 93 years old, going strong, and here with us today. Grandpa died this past January at 95 years of age, joyfully knowing this temple would become a reality. Many, many others from surrounding cities served with the same commitment. We celebrate them all today. Their dedication is an example to me of persistence, steadiness, and enduring to the end in service to their families and our fellow man. I've often said, anything in life worth having takes much effort. These faithful people showed me the way. The connection between homes, families, eternity, the temple, and our communities is profound. I hope you all know that you are loved and appreciated. Thank you so, so much for being here today for this joyous, groundbreaking celebration. I say these things most humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior, and my Advocate with our Heavenly Father. Amen.
I want to thank our speakers and our choir for those uh, inspiring messages in their presentations. Brothers and sisters, it is now our privilege to hear from Elder Gary B. Sabin, uh, General Authority 70. After his message, Elder Sabin will offer the prayer dedicating this site for the construction of a sacred temple, which will officially conclude our meeting today. However, after the prayer has concluded, we invite you to remain seated as we proceed with the turning of the soil. There will be three formal rotations of the soil turning and then an opportunity for others who wish to, to turn the soil as well. We'd like to invite all those who have been invited to participate in the first soil rotation to come forward after the dedication. We want to thank you, brothers and sisters, friends and guests, for being here today. We'll now hear from Elder Sabin. Thank you, Bob, for your great um, effort with you and your dear wife, Linda, in organizing this event. When I drove up with my wife, I got excited. I looked at these big earth-moving machines behind me and said, we're going to have fun today. <laughs> Not just shovels, but then I saw the shovels. So. Any, little, any boy who grows up wants to operate a big machine like that, right? So we're so grateful for, for your attendance here. Uh, brothers and sisters, distinguished guests, it's a great honor that you would uh, spend some time with us this morning. It's a very historic occasion. We're so grateful for all the members uh, past and present whose faith and courage has, have made this day possible. A long-awaited day on both sides of the veil. We're especially grateful for our beloved Father and His Son Jesus Christ uh, for this opportunity today and for the new temple which will soon rise behind us. Appreciate it very much, um, the primary choir. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you, Corbin, for that great reminder that the temple helps us become like Christ. And that we are, and when we come closer to Christ, we are more joyful. And men are that they might have joy reading the scriptures. Addison, uh, thank you for that reminder that a temple is a source of peace and comfort. It tells us who we are, of our identity and purpose in life. And Jerry, I'm so glad Eldon and Beth listened to a prophet and stayed here that you and your family could be here and thank you for that reminder of the importance of the sealing power that extends beyond mortality. As you were speaking I was reminded of my mother's funeral and just before the casket was closed my father walked up to the casket and kissed her on the cheek one last time before the casket was closed and I was the only one that heard this. He said Love you, sweetie. See you later. That's really the message of the temple, that no one really dies. The spirit is eternal. We, are, we have a mortal experience here for a temporary time, but we are spiritual beings having this mortal experience. We learn that very much in the temple. Mayor Zwallen, thank you for your wonderful words. As you spoke about a home, I was reminded of attending the funeral of Pat Holland, who was the dear wife of Elder Jeffrey Holland, one of our beloved apostles. And it was said of her, he said that Pat loved the temple so much she would have lived there. But so she made her home a temple on earth, so that when she gets to heaven, it will feel like home. As you were speaking, Mayor Zwall and I was reminded of an associate of mine, Elder Natras, who was having a meeting just like this in Vanuatu, where the groundbreaking of a new temple was being held. The Prime Minister was there of the country, and he invited the Prime Minister to come and share some remarks, which is sometimes risky. And uh, Elder Natras has spoken about the restored gospel and the prophetic calling of, calling of the Prophet Joseph Smith, and because of that, the sealing powers that Brother Callister talked about have been restored on the earth once and more. So when the Prime Minister stood up, he said, I want to talk about this man, Joseph Smith. He said, I felt something when Brother Natras was speaking. 
what he said was true. I believe it. So I'm going to start paying my tithing tomorrow to this church. Well, we don't have a prime minister here, and and mayor, uh, mayor as well, and already pays her tithing, so we don't need to worry about that. I assume so. <laughs> That's what makes temples possible, because if so many of you and those who have, throughout the world who pay their tithing, those sacred funds that make these blessings for the living and the dead possible. So thank you so much. As I was uh, given the assignment for this uh, groundbreaking, I was interested in looking into the history of the church in this area briefly. In 1851, Parley P. Pratt, then a member of the Twelve, he made San Francisco the headquarters of the Pacific Mission until the creation of the California Mission in 1892. And Latter-day Saints from the Intermountain West area began migrating from different parts of California, two different parts of California for educational, employment, and military opportunities. In this area, the migration began in earnest in 1905, when John Davis, a Latter-day Saint in Rexburg, Idaho, suffered a heart attack. His doctor suggested he move to a lower altitude and a milder climate for the winter months. He was a widower, and he had three children. So he took his three children, and they arrived in Modesto in December in 1905. Davis lived another 12 years before passing in 19. 17, and all four children, however, with their future families, formed the foundation of the church in this area. In 1920, two missionaries, Elder Reynolds Robinson from Wyoming and Elder Eli Searle from Idaho, were assigned to labor in Modesto for the first time on a full-time basis. The church began to grow in this area. On June 6, the Sunday school was organized in the home of Hiram and Celia Johnson at 217 Stanislaus Street, now Maisie Road, Maze Road. That sounds familiar to anyone. There were 20 members enrolled in Sunday school at that time. In 1923, the Modesto branch was created, and Alfred Cardwell, a manager of J.C. Penney Company, served as the first branch president. The branch met in various rented halls early on, including the Odd Fellows Hall, the Skyets, Skiets, Skyets Hall, and a room over a tobacco shop. We've come a long way since then with this beautiful building and many others. In 1925, the branch purchased a small chapel from a Pentecostal church at the intersection of 4th Street and F Street in the southwestern part of the town. As the church grew in Modesto, the members helped with the construction of a two-story addition to the chapel. In 1939, the Modesto branch became a ward. In 1954, 54, the Modesto ward was divided to create the Modesto first and the Modesto second ward. In 1964, the Modesto California Stake was created. In 1975, the Modesto California North Stake was created. In April of 2022, the Modesto California Temple was announced with an official rendering released in December of that year. So that's a wonderful journey through time to where we are today. This will be a beautiful building that will rise behind me, but a more importance are the sacred covenant ordinances that are entered into and which we hope enter into each of our hearts. Every temple has have these words above the entrance. Holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. It's the most sacred place of worship on earth. Temples are always a blessing to the communities. Our covenants to be honorable, honest, and moral make us better friends, neighbors, and citizens. It is a day of prophecy, my friends. President Nelson said, the president of the church, in coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. We are seeing one of those miracles today with another temple, and the greatest manifestation of the Savior's power, as he explained, is found inside his holy temple. We are living in a time yearned for and foretold by prophets when temples are dotting the earth. Before April conference, I was sitting next to President Nelson in the cafeteria, the General Authority cafeteria in Salt Lake City, just the two of us. And he turned to me and said, Gary, when I was born, there were five temples. I said, yes, President, and you've announced 119. 
He said, yes, and more soon coming. This was just before April conference. And he announced another 15, and, and, and last week another 20. So he has announced 154 temples. There are 335 temples now. Unlike 30,000 meeting houses like this one, temples are quite special. They're not open on Sunday. They're reserved for sacred ordinances and covenants. So we have 335 either in operation or that have been announced or are under construction. A time yearned for, as I said, by prophets of old. And we get to live in the midst of it. We're the Lord is preparing a people for the return of His Son. President Nelson said, Everything we believe in, every promise God has made to His covenant people come together in the temple. Two of the most commonly asked questions, which some of you may be asking, is what is a temple? And what do we do in the temples? We've learned a little bit about that today from these wonderful messages. A temple, simply stated, is a holy place, a sacred place, a house of prayer, a house of peace, a house of learning, a house of God. What do we do in temples? We learn about the nature of God, His plan for His children, the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. We make sacred promises to God and to serve others. We also make these covenants and promises available to our ancestors who pass through the veil without having this opportunity. A temple is a beacon of light, hope, and peace apart from the world and a symbol of the eternal nature of the soul. It is a stepping stone to eternity. I was taking the Prime Minister of Cape Verde through the open house of the Cape Verde Temple before it was dedicated. And hopefully all of you who have not seen the inside of a temple will have that opportunity prior to the dedication when this temple is completed. I told him in the foyer a little bit about temples and said, Mr. Prime Minister, you have a wonderful title of Prime Minister, but your most important title you will learn about in this temple, that is a title of a son of God. And he said, I will be back. He said, I often come and park outside the temple when nobody knows I'm coming, because he arrived with a big entourage of motorcycles and things. He said, I come by myself, and I just park outside the gates of this temple to feel of the peace and the light that emanates from this holy place. That is a temple. A temple helps us reflect on eternity so we can continually try to be better by following the example of Jesus Christ. The Apostle John wrote, But these are written, that ye might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing ye might have life through His name. So it is with temples. They help us live in with hope because of understanding of our true identity and purpose. Temples draw our attention to the eternal nature of mankind and answer the important questions of the soul. The book of Proverbs teaches us where there is no vision, the people perish. The temple provides vision with an eternal lens. A temple connects heaven and earth. It is like a stairway where those who have preceded us in the spirit world descend to us while we ascend to them. When I returned from my mission to Belgium and Holland as a young man, I was sitting on the couch next to my grandpa Saban. He suddenly turned to me and said, Gary, this reminds me of the day my mother died. I looked at him very stunned. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, he knew I, he saw I was startled, so he said, let me explain. When we went to the airport to greet you in Salt Lake, this was before TSA, you could actually see the plane come in, we were excited and there was a sense of anticipation. We had a welcoming party, as you know, with all of your family and some of your friends. And we were excited to see you. We'd missed you. You'd been gone for two years. It reminded me of the day I was working in the fields in Salem, Utah. My mother was on her deathbed. I was called to come quickly. I walked into the room. I looked at the foot of the bed, and I saw my father. He'd already died. He was standing there at the foot of the bed with a welcoming party. And there was a sense of anticipation and excitement. I could feel it was palpable in the room, waiting to welcome her home. And that reminded me so much of today. And that's why I said what I said. The same sociality that exists here exists there, except for it's not coupled with eternal glory that we will someday inherit if we are faithful. So we are eternal beings since naturally we have eternal relationships. 
without the eternal nature of the soul and the family unit, there would be no reason to build temples. If someone really died, we wouldn't bother meeting today or building temples. Elder John Groberg said, There is a connection between heaven and earth. Understanding that connection makes everything meaningful, including death. Not understanding that makes everything meaningless, including life. Sister Sabin and I served for five years in Europe. When we arrived, those of you who have traveled through Europe might have noticed that on many of the bridges over streams, over rivers, there are on the side of the bridges fences covered with padlocks. We thought, that's curious. Why are padlocks covering all these bridges? It's almost like a curtain. And we learned that a padlock is a significant sign between a couple. They buy a padlock, they sign the padlock, each of them, they clamp it or lock it on the bridge and then throw the key in the river as a symbol that their relationship is permanent somehow. If only they understood that it can actually be permanent in holy temples. When we enter the temple worthily, we leave the world behind. We begin by putting on white clothing. There are no Gucci labels in the temple. The pauper and prince are the same. No competition. We don't size each other up. We lift each other up. The temple symbolizes our journey from our premortal realm to earth and back into the presence of our Father. Birth and death are both essential steps in the unfolding drama of eternity. No one escapes. The singer Tim McGraw said, Someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. We all are dying. And we get a chance to live by understanding eternal promises and covenants. What happens when we die? President Kimball said we should be the happiest people of all because we have life with its opportunities, death without fear, and eternity with endless progression and development. I think there are seven R's I'll say quickly about the temple and our experience in the temple. When we go to the temple, the first R is we receive our endowment, a gift of heavenly power. In Doctrine and Covenants 43 we read, And ye shall be taught from on high, sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be endowed with power that ye may, be, that ye may give even as I have spoken. So we go to the temple to receive ordinances, to make covenants, to be endowed with power, to understand the purpose of life, the creation, the role of Jesus Christ, and the love of our Father and His Son for His children, and how we can return home. That power helps us with our everyday challenges. Second R, we go to redeem the dead. It's symbolic of the Savior who did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's a gift of love for those who have passed on, doing for others what they cannot do for themselves. President Nelson said, Consider the great mercy and fairness of God, who before the foundation of the world provided a way to give temple blessings to those who died without a knowledge of the gospel. These sacred temple rites are ancient. To me, that is, to me, that antiquity is thrilling and another evidence of their authenticity. Joseph Smith was heartbroken when his older brother Alvin died at the age of 25 in 1823, 13 year, years before the temple ordinances were, were restored on the earth. Joseph loved Alvin dearly, and he and Emma named their first child Am, uh, Alvin. The precious boy died shortly after he was born. Five other children of Joseph and Emma lived less than two years. In 1836, while, the Kirtland while in the Kirtland Temple, Joseph received a vision in which he saw his brother Alvin and his father and mother and others who were deceased in the celestial kingdom, which is the highest degree of glory in heaven. You can imagine the joy Joseph and Emma felt when Joseph received this revelation, which we now have as section 137 of the Doctrine and Covenants, in which he recorded, Thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom. Also all that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. The prevalent religious teachings of the day taught that the souls of those who had not been baptized into any specific religion were lost. Joseph Smith Sr. earnestly requested that Alvin be baptized vicariously just a month before the doctrine of baptism for the dead was revealed, and not before his own death. Among his last words, and not long before his own death, among his last words were, I see Alvin. 
In accordance with his father's request, Hiram Smith was baptized for Alvin by proxy in 1840. If there ever was a doctrine that evidenced the truthfulness of the gospel and the fairness and love of God, this is it. The eternal truth that all who have died without a knowledge of the gospel, who would have received it with, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom. This truth resonates with every sincere heart. Christopher Stendhal, the Dean of Divinity Emeritus at Harvard University, said this, I feel that the Latter-day Saint experience of the temple has sort of restored that meaning to the word temple. Temple was the house of God. It was where the divine and the human touched. In 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul speaks about those who baptize themselves for the dead, and obviously takes for granted that A, there were people who did so, and has no complaint about it. Now with the Latter-day Saints, we have it again as a practice. It's a beautiful thing. I could think of myself as taking part in such an act, extending the blessing that has come to me in and through Jesus Christ. That's generous. That's beautiful. The next R is remember. We go to the temple to remember who we are so that we never forget the blessings we have and the promises we have made. David, the great king of Israel, forgot who he was. We, go, we partake of the sacrament to always remember him, that we might have his spirit to be with us. David had great potential, but in the scriptures it says when kings were at war, David tarried in Jerusalem. He forgot his duty. We also go to receive revelation. Eternal truths and earthly direction can be found in holy temples. We go to repent, to ask, what lack I yet? We let go of our pride. We forgive freely. Repentance not only cleanses us, but gives us new strength. We go to the temple to be refreshed, rejuvenated, renewed, fortified by understanding our true identity and our divine purpose. We go to count our blessings. Elder Dale Redmond of the Quorum of the Twelve said, You'll find not only protection from the temptation and ills of this world, speaking of temples, but you'll also find personal power, power to change, power to repent, power to learn, power to be sanctified, power to turn the hearts of your family together, and heal that which needs healing. Elder David Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve said, I promise that you will be protected from the intensifying influence of the adversary. As you participate and love this holy work, you will be safeguarded in your youth and throughout your lives. Final R is to return often. We come back often to be fortified and guided in our journey home to remember. President Nelson said, My dear brothers and sisters, the assaults of the adversary are increasing exponentially in intensity and in variety. Our need to be in the temple on a regular basis has never been greater. I plead with you to seek prayerfully and consistently to understand temple covenants and ordinances. Spiritual doors will open. You'll learn how to part the veil between heaven and earth. Think about that for a moment. How to ask for God's angels to attend you and how better to receive direction from heaven. We would not want that, who would not want that blessing as promised by our dear prophet? Well, thank you brothers and sisters, distinguished guests and friends for being here today under this hot sun. We greatly appreciate that you would spend your time with us. My prayer and earnest desire is that this day will mark the beginning of a new season of joy, peace, and excitement for the work of our Father and His Son in this part of His vineyard. I bear my witness that I know God is our Father, that He loves His children dearly. He knows each one of us by name and wants the best for us. He wants us to return home. And he's made it possible through the wonderful, amazing gift of his son, his beloved son, Jesus Christ, who's made it possible for us to overcome our weaknesses, to repent of our sins. He's broken the bands of death. He's made it possible for us to be perfected one day. He's filled all of the sins and sicknesses of mankind. He understands how to succor us in our needs. I know that Jesus is the Christ, that he lives, that he loves us, and he's made this wonderful day possible because of the love of his Father and his love for us. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now if you will bow your heads and join me while I offer the dedicatory prayer. Our beloved Father in heaven, we thy children are grateful for the privilege of assembling this day to dedicate this wonderful site 
in preparation for the construction of thy holy temple here in Modesto, California. We are grateful, Father, for thy plan of salvation and for the saving ordinances performed in holy temples. We are grateful for thee and for thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and for the hope, comfort, and clarity that flows from his atoning sacrifice and the eternal perspective that comes from understanding our identity as thy children. We are grateful, Father, for the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and for the role of the prophet Joseph Smith and all those prophets who preceded him and followed him up to and including our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. We are grateful for the many early saints who settled in this area. We acknowledge their faith and sacrifice in building up the church in this area in preparation for this historic day. We are also grateful for the goodness and support of the citizens and civic leaders in this and the surrounding communities. We know that the completion of this temple will be a great blessing to this community, as it will stand as a beacon of light and hope, and a witness of the reality and divinity of thy beloved Son, and of the eternal nature of the soul, and the divine potential of thy children. Dear Father, as we turn over these first shovels of dirt to mark the construction of this temple, we pray that thou would hallow this site, and that all who are privileged to work, to visit or work on this site, will feel a sense of the divine. We ask that all who work on this edifice be protected from harm and accident, and that the elements will be tempered so thy work can go forth unhindered. We pray that the way will be hedged up to any hand that is lifted to thwart or deface this temple. Please, Father, bless the members who this temple will serve with a sense of urgency to seek out their ancestors who have been waiting for their saving ordinances. Please bless parents and leaders to teach their children and the members in this temple district with a sense of purpose and desire to prepare for the day when they will be privileged to enter these sacred doors and make covenants with thee and thy son and to help those on the other side of the veil to do so. That all may receive the intended blessings thou hast for thy children. We pray, Father, that the preparation for and the future service in this holy house will refine and sanctify all those who serve here in any way, including ordinance workers, employees, missionaries, and patrons. Now, dear Father, acting under the direction of President Russell M. Nelson and by the authority of the Holy Melchizedek Priesthood, I hereby consecrate and dedicate this site for the building of thy holy house, the Modesto California Temple for thy church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We dedicate these grounds as a hallowed place and reminder that ordinary people can do extraordinary things with the help of God, the support of family, and the fellowship of friends. We pray that a spirit of peace and serenity will attend this wonderful refuge from the world, that all who pass by or visit these grounds will feel thy power. May we now increase our personal commitment to go forward with greater resolve, to live our own lives more unselfishly and with more courage and faith that as we dedicate this ground, we will feel compelled to rededicate our lives to Thee and to Thy beloved Son. This prayer we offer with gratitude for all those who have made this day possible, and do so in the most sacred name of Thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll now have the opportunity to participate in a formal soil rotations. We we'll ask those who have participated in turning of the soil to leave their shovels in the soil and then return to their seats. We we'll invite all those who have been invited to participate in the first rotation of the formal groundbreaking to come forward at this time.
Here. That was fast. 